Late at night, I was in unbearable pain and had Alan take me to the hospital. However, he asked me to endure it. Maggie's neighborhood had a power outage, and she was scared with her child, so I went to check on them first. He didn't return that night. Early the next morning, Maggie sent me a photo. In the photo, Alan was wearing an apron in the kitchen. He was holding a spatula, looking helpless. Maggie said, Alan will definitely be a good dad in the future. I was lying in the hospital bed, having just lost my child. I said to her, I'm sending you. Chapter 1. Valentine's Day falls on a Saturday, it's a shame not to celebrate a little. Let's go see a movie first, then have dinner. What do you want to eat? How about a seafood buffet? I said excitedly. Alan looked hesitant. What's wrong? I asked. Maggie said Susie wants to go to Searsville tomorrow. There seems to be a themed event there, and Maggie is afraid she can't watch the child alone. Can't she ask her parents for help? Or her friends? Does it have to be you? I held back a sigh of frustration, needing to vent. Alan sighed. Her parents are not that young anymore, where would they find the energy? And tomorrow is Valentine's Day, and it's Saturday, friends also have their own plans. You also know it's Valentine's Day? Everyone's busy, except you? Alan furrowed his brows, raising his voice, what's the point of arguing about these things with a child? Does she understand Valentine's Day? I turned cold, about to leave. Alan panicked. He grabbed me, Vicky, can you not be mad at me? I have no choice, you know, Maggie asked me, and I can't refuse. I felt exhausted, when will this end? Alan said, when Susie grows up and Maggie adapts, it will be fine. He said it without conviction. I didn't know where to start questioning, so I had to compromise once again. Never mind, let it go. Chapter 2 On Valentine's Day, my husband went to celebrate with someone else. I couldn't be angry or resentful, I had to smile and send them off. They had a great time, enjoying the seafood buffet I wanted. Meanwhile, I was stuck at home eating instant noodles. This made me furious. So I decisively ordered the bag I had been eyeing for a long time but couldn't bring myself to buy, using Alan's card. Not long after, Alan's call came. He chuckled, not angry anymore. I stiffly replied, I wasn't angry to begin with. Yeah, yeah, our little sweetheart is very forgiving. What did you have for lunch? I glanced at the instant noodles, about to answer. Maggie's voice came through on the other end of the phone. Alan, I'm exhausted, can you hold Susie for me? Little chubby, have you gained weight again? Humph, I hate mom. Daddy hug. The word daddy made my head buzz. Alan. Vicky, I'll hang up first, we'll talk when I get back. The call ended, and my heart twisted into a pretzel. Without much thought, I called back immediately. No answer. Hung up and dialed again, still no answer. It wasn't until the fourth call that Maggie picked up. Vicky? What's up? Where's Alan? Let him answer the phone. As if she hadn't sensed the coldness in my voice, she continued gently, Alan is taking Susie on the cable car, he can't answer the phone right now. Do you need something? I'll tell him after we're done. This conversation made me feel absurdly out of place. As if she was Alan's wife, and I was just an outsider without insight. Maggie continued, don't worry, Alan is fine, we're having a great time. I'll send you some photos later, it's a festival today, you should experience it too. Before she could finish, I hung up the phone directly. I was afraid I would curse if I didn't hang up. Chapter 3 the current Maggie makes me feel incredibly strange. But from the incident until now, it's only been a year. Times change, things change. Maggie's husband's name is John, he was Alan's childhood friend. A year ago, he passed away. It happened suddenly, without warning. That day was like any other, after work, John made plans with Alan to play basketball. Alan was thinking of bringing me some duck dishes, so he left early. But John was still in high spirits. However, just half an hour after Alan left, John had a heart attack and passed away. This plunged Alan into extreme self-blame and self-loathing. Just half a minute, if only I had fought for half a minute, he might not have died. 
Alan is a doctor, and he believed he could have saved John. But he happened to leave early on that day. Such agony nearly engulfed him. I couldn't bear to see it. So, when Maggie didn't know what to do about the clogged sewer, I agreed to let Alan go. It was the first time, also the third month after John's passing. Chapter 4 Maggie kept her promise. She sent me dozens of photos. There were pictures of Alan holding Susie, walking with Susie, and even Alan peeling shrimp for Susie. In the images, Alan looked gentle, his gaze towards Susie filled with indulgence and affection. One photo stood out to me, a rare one with Maggie in it. She and Alan sandwiched Susie in between them, all three wearing happy smiles. Surprisingly, it didn't seem out of place at all. They looked just like a family of three. Alan didn't return until 10 p.m. He looked exhausted, and as soon as he saw me, he said, so tired. Susie has so much energy, I'm completely worn out, but she's still bouncing around. Don't be fooled by her being a little girl, when she gets rowdy, she's no less than anyone's son. Oh, by the way, something really interesting happened today. Excitedly, Alan recounted various moments about Susie to me, like a father eager to show off his daughter. I watched him quietly. After a long silence, Alan finally realized something was off. What's wrong? Are you angry? I asked him, don't you have anything else to tell me? Furrowing his brows, Alan couldn't hide his impatience behind his weariness. If there were a narrator, at this moment his inner voice would probably be, what's wrong now? What do you want to say, just say it. My already uneasy mood added another layer of obstruction. Alan, why does Susie call you dad? Annoyed, Alan rubbed his temples. She missed her dad, she asked if she could call me dad for the day. What was I supposed to do? No explanation, no comfort, no guilt. He threw the question back at me, just like he had many times before. Alan and I parted on bad terms, and he was relegated to the guest room by me. Despite his attempts to have a proper conversation with me halfway through, I rejected him. He eventually got angry and coldly walked into the guest room. Chapter 5 When John was around, he doted on Maggie. Everyone knew he was a slave to his wife. Later, when they had a daughter, he became obsessed with pampering her. Of course, Maggie had that allure. She was pretty enough and highly educated. To be with John, she gave up a promising career and became a homemaker. John once said, this is my way of making it up to you. And he lived up to his words. In this way, he spoiled Maggie rotten. Maggie didn't know how to pay the utilities, so Alan taught her. But she exclaimed, it's so difficult. Helplessly, Alan replied, I'll pay them for you from now on. Maggie couldn't cook and almost burned down the kitchen once. Alan had to drop his work and rush over. Later on, he started ordering takeout for Maggie. Can't she order for herself? Just something I do. When the lights in the house went out, Maggie didn't know what to do. She could have called an electrician. A single mother, it's unsafe to let a stranger in. One time, while Alan and I were catching up on overdue assignments, we were both in the groove when Maggie called. Susie vomited, what do I do? Alan, help me. Without a second thought, Alan got dressed and left, without even giving me a chance to grab a blanket. It turned out Maggie had fed Susie snail noodles. The child, not even fully grown, was rushed to the hospital due to the spiciness. Maggie couldn't handle taking the child out alone, whether for a fun outing or when the child fell ill. Alan was always at her beck and call. He took on John's responsibilities. This helped him gradually calm his mind. I knew he was making amends. But this process of atonement was making me more and more uncomfortable. I felt like I was reaching my breaking point. Chapter 6 I was getting ready to talk to Alan. But when I woke up in the morning, he was already gone. There was breakfast on the table, packed in a thermos. There was porridge, buns, and eggs. There was also a note on the side, Vicky, I'm sorry for yesterday when I had a bad temper and shouldn't have spoken to you like that. I know you've been understanding and accommodating me. Can you give me a little more time? After a long silence, I quietly ate the breakfast. Alan was really busy. When I called him, a nurse answered and said Alan was in the operating room. 
one surgery in the morning, two in the afternoon, there was no way he could leave on time. Since I wasn't busy today, I decided to prepare some food to take over. It had been a long time since I last brought food for Alan. Not that I didn't want to, but our recent conflicts were becoming more and more frequent. When I arrived at the office, I greeted the nurse. She stared at me wide-eyed, even stuttering in her speech. At first, I didn't pay much attention, but when I pushed open Alan's office door, I finally understood. Apparently, they thought I had come to catch Alan cheating. There was Maggie, sitting in Alan's office chair without shoes, playing games on her phone with Alan's coat draped over her legs. On the desk was a box of cupcakes, already half-eaten. How should I feel? Not so surprised, not very shocked either. But my heart couldn't help but sink deeper and deeper. Vicky, you're here. Have a seat, make yourself at home. Want a cupcake? Alan bought it for me, he was afraid I'd get hungry. Chapter 7 Maggie has been feeling down lately, being alone at home can lead to overthinking. She just wanted someone to eat with her, I couldn't say no. This was the explanation I waited for an hour to hear. I was finding it harder and harder to see where Alan's boundaries lay. Today you can bring her to the office, tomorrow are you going to take her home? The day after, should we just give her half of the bed directly? Alan frowned, what nonsense are you talking about? I sighed. Sometimes, we bring some of the troubles upon ourselves. When you asked me this morning if I could give you some time, my answer is, I can't. After saying that, I stood up to leave. Alan grabbed my hand. What do you mean? Alan, either you kick Maggie out of our lives, or I kick you out. Your choice. He glared at me, his eyes burning, are you really going to force me like this? I gritted my teeth, force you. You were the one who said you'd give her and the orphan 20,000, and I didn't even hesitate to agree. For the past half year, because of Maggie, I've been living in a widowed marriage. What more do you want from me? Alan, I've endured enough. It's time for you to make a choice. I don't understand. Alan growled, John is gone, I just wanted to help him, why does it make you so unbearable? There's nothing between me and Maggie, why are you overreacting? I looked at Alan disappointedly. I never knew he could act so clueless when he clearly understood. Let go. Alan's face turned cold, gripping my hand with more force. A wave of nausea swept over me. I said let go. In the struggle, I finally turned my head and spat out. Nervously, Alan hugged me, what's wrong? Are you feeling unwell? Breathing heavily in discomfort, I spitefully said, I'm fine, it's just your words that disgust me. Alan's hand tightened abruptly, causing my shoulders to ache. Chapter 8 Alan and I entered a cold war. But he seemed to have changed. He still left early and returned late every day. I didn't know how he was at the hospital, but at least at home, he no longer went out in the middle of the night, and there were no more incessant phone calls. Yet, I didn't feel relieved. It felt like a weight was pressing on my chest, sometimes even making it hard to breathe. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'm not a particularly emotionally sensitive person, or else I wouldn't have kept indulging Alan time and time again. But Maggie managed to push me to this point, she really had some skills. One day, feeling restless, I lay on the bed. In a daze, the bedroom door opened, and Alan walked in. After a while, the space beside me sank, and Alan wrapped me in the blanket. I opened my eyes. He buried his face in my back. Muffled, he said, don't be mad at me, I'll change. He said he wouldn't let Maggie go to his office, he wouldn't order meals for Maggie anymore, he wouldn't go to Maggie's house alone, and if he had to, he would go with me. He promised he would remove Maggie from our lives. So, when Maggie called him again, saying the pipes at her place burst and she didn't know what to do, I went with Alan to her house. Maggie opened the door quickly, drenched all over, wearing a bright red silk camisole that was sticking to her body due to being soaked, even the outlines were clearly visible. Before I could react, she had already hugged herself and started screaming. As if I were the opposite sex that needed to be guarded against. I turned cold, grabbed Alan, and walked away. How many times is this now? What number is this? How many times has she exposed herself in front of you? Alan fell silent. 
I just came to help, why does it sound so disgusting coming from you? It turns out I was the disgusting one. Alan, let's get a divorce. What? I suddenly feel like you're a bit dirty, don't even know when you got dirty, too stubborn. Chapter 9 In the end, Alan didn't go up again, but he still contacted the property management. See, how easy was that? We returned home in silence. Alan said, Vicky, let's talk. I shook my head, too tired, engulfed by exhaustion inside out. Tomorrow, okay. I fell into a deep sleep. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by a piercing pain in my stomach. It hurt too much, sweating cold. Alan, Alan. I murmured, not even sure if I made a sound. At that moment, Alan pushed open the bedroom door and walked in. In severe pain, I didn't notice that Alan was already dressed neatly. I grabbed his hand, Alan, my stomach hurts, take me to the hospital. But Alan interrupted me. Stomach ache? Vicky, bear with it, I'll come back and take you later. There's a power outage in Maggie's neighborhood, Susie is terrified and crying hysterically, a bit traumatized, I have to go check on them. Alan, take me to the hospital. At that moment, I didn't know how serious it was, I just instinctively felt like I had to go to the hospital. Alan pushed my hand away. Be more sensible, Susie is John's only child in this world, do you have to compete with her? With that, he left without looking back. Ignoring my ghastly pale face, ignoring my desperate pleas. My heart sank to the bottom. Ah! I cried out in agony, lifting the blanket, a pool of bright red. In the end, I called a Didi ride for the neighborhood. They didn't mind if I dirtied their car, the couple took me to the hospital. I had a miscarriage. My first child came and went without a sound. I asked the doctor for the reason. The doctor comforted me, this is your body making a decision for you. You are not suitable to carry this child now, it is protecting you. So that's how it is. In the end, it was myself who could protect me. Later on, I fell into a deep sleep, waking up a few times in between, casually replying to a message from Maggie. When I opened my eyes again, Alan was standing by my bed. His face was pale, his eyes bloodshot. I wasn't surprised to see him there, this was their hospital, and many doctors had seen me, someone must have informed him. Trembling, Alan grabbed my hand, Vicky, it's all right, we can have another child. I coldly pulled my hand away, Alan, let's get a divorce. His face twitched. Vicky, it's my fault, I was wrong. I didn't know, I didn't know it would be so serious, Vicky, I beg you, give me another chance. Alan, let's get a divorce. Alan didn't agree to the divorce. After being discharged, he brought me back home, taking care of me attentively and sincerely, even taking time off work for it. I accepted his care calmly. I lost his child, it was his duty. Moreover, he is a doctor, he knows how to take care of someone better. It was during this postpartum period that I found out Alan could cook. But he didn't learn for me, and it wasn't the first time he cooked for me. He said a lot of things to me. He begged for my forgiveness. Said he would change. He said he wouldn't bother with Maggie anymore. He wanted to live well with me. But I had already given up on that idea. People, until the last straw is pressed down, are always unwilling to admit defeat. Why didn't I leave earlier when I knew he would be like this? Because of feelings. If these feelings don't fade to nothing, how can one bear to leave? Now, there's nothing left. The only thing I could say to Alan was, let's get a divorce. He slumped, he was in pain, he was helpless. Maggie found me at this time. She said she wanted to talk to me. So, while Alan was out grocery shopping, I invited her over to the house. Maggie has always been good looking. With her Chanel style dress, perfectly styled hair, exquisite makeup, and manicured nails. She said, I'm sorry for making you lose the child. I chuckled, if you admit it like that, I should call the police. Maggie's face stiffened. Just say what you want to say, you don't have much time. After a long silence, Maggie spoke up, give Alan to me, without Alan, I can't go on. 
I'm different from you, you have a job and abilities, but I've gone off track with society, I still have a child, only Alan can take care of us. I didn't really understand Maggie. She was a graduate of a prestigious university and had worked for Fortune 500 companies. Why did she end up like this? Of course, that's not my concern. I looked her up and down. I've already mentioned divorce to Alan, but he disagreed. It seems like you want to cling to him, you'll have to try harder. Maggie left. When Alan returned, I brought up divorce again. He quietly glanced at me, as if he hadn't heard. He turned and went into the kitchen. Chapter 10 Divorce is not an easy thing. If an agreement can't be reached, then a lawsuit must be filed. But lawsuits are such a hassle, time-consuming and exhausting, it's better to wait for a third party. Thinking this way, I didn't feel rushed. Perhaps I had pushed Alan to the edge. He stayed by my side continuously and even took a day off to be with me. Antony has a new place, inviting us over to warm the house, do you want to go with me? I flipped a page in my book, I'm not going. Then I'll go grab a bite and come back. Okay. After saying that, I focused on my book. But when I finished a page, the person standing beside me hadn't moved. I lifted my head in confusion, is there something else? Alan's face looked pale, he forced a smile and shook his head, what do you want to eat? I'll buy it for you. No need. Then I'll go, I'll be back soon. Once he closed the door behind him and left, I put down my book. I closed my eyes wearily and let out a sigh. I knew what Alan was hoping for. He wished I would nag a bit more, like in the past, reminding him not to drink, drive slowly, and come home early. But he didn't notice that each time he came home late for Maggie, I withdrew my reminders. It wasn't about being able to let go, but more about being stubborn most of the time. If I don't contact you, will you reach out to me? If I don't call you, will you know I'm upset? I pretended to be magnanimous, hoping you would see through my facade. I said, it's okay, go ahead. I hoped you would say, never mind, I'll stay home with you. But Alan never once did as I hoped. Disappointment, sadness, frustration. He held my hand and walked forward, but his attention was drawn elsewhere, I pulled away from him, wanting to catch his eye, but he didn't even turn back once. I watched him walk further away, disappearing into the crowd. Finally, filled with disappointment, I turned and left, but he suddenly turned around to look for me. What is this? A time difference in love. Is it sorrowful? Quite sorrowful. But more than anything, it's a feeling of being lost. Alan came back very late. I heard the sound of the door opening and closing. I thought he had gone into the room, so I was about to go out to get some water. But I saw Alan sitting quietly on the sofa. I was taken aback. He looked up and saw me, immediately masking the vulnerability on his face. He smiled and asked me, what's wrong? Are you hungry? I said, thirsty. I opened the fridge to get some water, but Alan stood up. Don't drink cold water, I'll go heat some up. No need to bother. It's okay, very quick, two minutes. No need. It's really nothing, just wait a moment. Alan. I called out to him, I don't want to drink anymore. After saying that, I turned to go back to the room. Alan stumbled over to me, bumping into the table with a muffled groan. He grabbed my hand, Vicky, I don't understand, how did we end up like this? Alan reeked of alcohol, his voice hoarse, hands trembling. Vicky, am I really unforgivable? Feeling a bit emotional, I sighed and raised my head. On the day of my miscarriage, you were at Maggie's house making breakfast for her and Susie. Maggie said you would be a good father. Do you know what I was thinking at that time? I breathed a sigh of relief, thankfully this child is gone. Alan let out a choked sob. After the miscarriage, I never discussed this child with Alan. It was impossible to talk about. He was gone even before we knew of his existence. Perhaps he felt we were unfit parents. Alan, have you ever thought about what would have happened if this child hadn't been lost? Alan remained silent. I continued, I would probably have forgiven you. 
You didn't commit a fundamental mistake. You didn't actively engage with someone else. Even though you felt sorry for her, ultimately it was just about helping others. Moreover, once we had a child, things would gradually get better. That's probably how I would try to convince myself. And then the beginning of an unfathomable abyss. No, no, we will overcome and get better, live happily ever after. It's all my fault, I was wrong, Vicky, it's all my fault. I've let you down, I've let the child down, it's all my fault. Alan stubbornly insisted. Alan, if our child was born, and both Maggie's child and our child fell ill at the same time, who would you take to the hospital first? I would definitely. Alan urgently tried to give me an answer. I interrupted him, you would go to take Maggie's child. Because she doesn't know anything, she wouldn't know where to register, where to get medication, she could get lost even in a hospital. Initially, you might feel guilty towards your own child, but you would think, in the end, he is your child, you have to be good to him for a lifetime. And gradually, even that initial guilt would disappear, everything would seem natural. You have a father, she doesn't have one, can't you help her? She's already pitiful enough, are you still going to compete with her? You are already happy enough, why be so selfish? A child who clearly has a father, yet seems fatherless. Just like me, clearly having a husband, yet feeling husbandless. I wouldn't, how could I possibly do that? Alan shook his head helplessly, his words feeble and pale. I looked at him, wouldn't you? Then why do you keep treating me like this? Alan's face turned ashen. I'll change, Vicky, I will change. I nodded, I believe you, but I dare not bet on it. How long can a miscarried child stay in his memory? A month, two months. Or a year, half a year? He will surely change. Would he still be considered human if he doesn't change? But Maggie is still here, her child is still here, all the problems persist. Can he really turn a blind eye, deaf ear to it all? Isn't it just going to be another cycle in the end? Compared to waking up with a start, I believe in repeating mistakes. Chapter 11 Maggie sent me a message, you're going to get a divorce, right? I furrowed my brows. I didn't want to engage with her, but in the end, I couldn't help but reply, mind your own business. In front of me, Alan deleted all of Maggie's contact information. Before he deleted them, I saw numerous missed calls and unread messages. Maggie was flustered by Alan's actions. This woman isn't someone who could survive in the harem for 80 episodes. A couple of days ago, John's father was hospitalized due to high blood pressure. I heard that John's wife personally took care of him. How touching. But where would Maggie find the ability to care for others? She can't even take care of her own child properly. However, this might be the only way she could get close to Alan. Combining her messages to me, her intentions were clear. But I didn't expect her to act so quickly. That night, Alan didn't come back on time. In the early morning, Maggie sent me two explicit photos. She and Alan had been in bed together. In that moment, I had only one thought in my mind, as expected. Chapter 12 I waited for Alan all night. The next morning, I opened the door to find Alan leaning against the wall. I didn't know how long he had been here. But the cigarette butts all over the floor indicated it wasn't a short time. He looked up at me and forced out an awkward smile, Vicky, are you hungry? What would you like to eat? I'll make it for you. I shook my head, you're mistaken. You should say to me, Vicky, let's get a divorce. Alan's expression faltered, you already know. I remained silent. He took a step forward suddenly, trying to grab me. I stepped back repeatedly. Stiffening in place, he weakly said, I drank too much, Vicky, I didn't mean to, I was just drunk. I was tired of his self-deception. Alan, you're a doctor. Are you going to tell me that alcohol can control others to do things they don't want to do? Is it really at that point? Alan, it's just alcohol. I don't believe in drunken mistakes, I only believe in using alcohol as an excuse for promiscuity. Alan clenched his fist. Was it intentional, right? What? Maggie showed me your chat history. You actually wanted her to do something, you were just waiting for me to make a mistake, right? 
disappointment reached its peak, people can actually laugh it off. So, I was just waiting for you to make a mistake. Fortunately, I didn't forgive you. Chapter 13. Alan and I got divorced. He left with nothing, giving me the money, house, and car. In the end, he had only one request, Vicky, don't hate me. I remained noncommittal. Hate? Where did such intense emotions come from? I wrapped the car in film, changing the stable black to a flashy red, including the interior, such as the seat covers. The whole car looked rejuvenated. That day, I found Alan's fitness equipment in the cabinet. He had bought it and never used it, too busy with work at first, then with Maggie. So, I passed it on to the high school student downstairs. He was very happy, and his mother even gave me a bag of tomatoes. Alan's pillow was left behind, the latex pillow he bought, shockingly expensive but undeniably comfortable. Used items are not suitable for gifting, so I threw it in the trash. By the way, I also replaced all the bed linens. Alan liked dark colors, but I preferred lighter shades. A few clinical books of Alan's were wedged into my bookshelf. After some thought, I sent them directly to the hospital. I gathered all the gifts he had given me, put them up for sale, and they sold quite well. Slowly but surely, I removed all traces of Alan from my life. This process brought me to tears many times. After all, he was the man I went from school uniform to wedding dress with. All of this wasn't difficult. The most challenging part was actually dealing with our parents. We quietly divorced, and by the time they found out, it was too late to change anything. His mother and my mother both cried in front of me. One scolded me for being impulsive, the other scolded her son for being immature. I explained the conflicts between Alan and me to them but kept the fact that Alan and Maggie slept together hidden. This was to give each other some dignity. But Maggie didn't want this kind of dignity. She forced herself into Alan's home. She said, either get married, or I'll spread the news about you and Alan. Alan's parents were almost hospitalized with anger, my mom also shifted her focus, starting to scold Alan. But my life continued. I worked alone, went home alone, and enjoyed my solitude. Before long, I adapted. My mom asked me, are you still not going to get married? I politely refused, no thanks. My mom started crying again, saying Alan had ruined me. It's quite a headache. But actually, I wanted to say, I have many ways to find happiness, and marriage is actually the riskiest. Shh, this is just how I feel, not applicable to everyone. Chapter 14. Alan and Maggie got married. They only got the certificate, no ceremony. But everyone who needed to know found out. Gossip slowly started to spread. Some say Alan's initial intentions were not pure, he gave Maggie 200,000, helped her so much, actually had ill intentions towards Maggie. Maybe they weren't clean while John was still around. Gossip, it only gets dirtier, never clean. Some say Maggie is like a band-aid, once stuck, can't be thrown away. Alan got what he deserved, rushing to be a scapegoat. Now, he's reaping what he sowed. Some envy Maggie. Being pretty is good, as soon as one man dies, another one is there to take his place, and each one better than the last. For a woman to reach this point, it's worth it. Maggie is a smart person, she found a good place to settle down. This is the unanimous thought in everyone's minds. But only Maggie knows, she's not doing well, not well at all. No wedding, she endured it, after all, John had only been gone for a year, it wouldn't sound good if it got out. But what she didn't expect was for Alan to let her stay with him in the hospital dormitory. Alan left with nothing, gave Vicky the money, car, and house. Vicky is really ruthless. An infuriated Maggie went to find her. She demanded that Vicky redistribute the assets with Alan. Vicky nodded, smiling ambiguously, and said, Are you going to give me back the 200,000 Alan gave you? Maggie, you're such a good person. Maggie's chest was blocked and painful. She screamed, how can you be so shameless? Vicky remained indifferent, when I still considered you a person, don't act shamelessly. Maggie was a bit puzzled. Vicky had never spoken harshly to her before. Even when she repeatedly provoked Vicky, Vicky didn't dare say a word. Wasn't she someone easy to control? Why the change? Maggie didn't know, all the respect Vicky showed her was out of respect for John. 
She was John's widow, the mother of John's only child. Respect the deceased. Not just Vicky, everyone else was the same. Those who associated with Maggie, those who made things convenient for her, all because of John. Including Alan. Everyone had changed. The women who used to go shopping, get their nails done, and hang out with her all cut off contact. Maggie, infuriated, demanded to know the reason. One person said, we used to invite you out because we thought you were feeling down, but now you seem pretty happy. The gym where she used to work out for free denied her entry. She asked why. The owner chuckled, let your husband Alan get a membership, he's not short on cash for that. Maggie was furious. She told Alan about this incident, hoping for comfort from him. But Alan said, they were all John's friends, not Maggie's. Ouch. After leaving John, Maggie realized she didn't have a single friend. No, she still had Alan. Alan was the best person to her in the world, surpassing John. It's okay, Alan leaving with nothing is okay. He can earn enough money for himself. Chapter 15 But Alan had changed too. She wanted to move back to the big house. Alan refused. That's John's house, you should sell it, then give half the money to John's parents. Maggie widened her eyes, why should I? Because that's John's house, his parents have a right to inherit it. They are letting it go for the sake of their child, you should be understanding. Maggie was infuriated. She locked herself in the room, hoping Alan would come to comfort her, just like he had done many times before. But Alan didn't come. Not only did he not console her, he didn't even cook for her. When Maggie said she was hungry, Alan told her to go eat at the hospital cafeteria. When she said she didn't like that, Alan told her to order takeout. This wasn't right. Maggie was on the verge of tears. Clearly, Alan used to help her with meals, and occasionally even cooked for her. Alan said, as long as I have time, I'll come over and cook for you. The food should still be delicious. Maggie confronted Alan. Tiredly, Alan rubbed his forehead. I was just worried back then that you might be so devastated by John's sudden departure that you'd neglect your health. Maggie had a knack for ignoring things she didn't want to hear. So she questioned Alan, so, are you not afraid of me getting upset now? Alan looked at her strangely. If you were truly upset, why were you so eager to climb into my bed? Chapter 16 The current days were clearly what Maggie had fought for, but she wasn't happy at all. Alan was always angry with her. He got mad because she hired a cleaner, got mad because she sent clothes for dry cleaning, got mad because she hired a cook, got mad because she didn't pick up Susie on time, got mad because she didn't know how to take Susie to the doctor. But clearly, Alan was in the wrong. All these were his responsibilities. He was the one who should take care of himself and Susie. Now that he had backed out, was it wrong for her to hire help? Did he expect her to do it all? She wouldn't. Maggie decided to teach Alan a lesson. She joined a tour group and went on an impromptu trip. She had a great time. Until one day, her card was declined. Maggie was shocked. She called Alan, asking him to send her money. Alan coldly replied, there's none left. What do you mean, there's none left? It just means there's no money. Maggie didn't believe it and rushed back that night. She questioned Alan, are you really not giving me any money to use now? Alan, how could you do this? Alan remained expressionless, saying, I have no money. I don't believe you. Alan sneered, I'm just a doctor, a regular doctor. Why do you think I'm rich? But you clearly used to. Alan interrupted her, because back then there was Vicky, she could help me bear the burden. What can you do? You're useless. Maggie had never been spoken to like this before. She screamed in anger, I want a divorce. But Alan directly pulled out the divorce agreement, saying, sign it. Chapter 17. Maggie was just trying to scare Alan. How could she really divorce him? Who would she go to if she left Alan? She just wanted Alan to give her money to use. But faced with Alan's resolute attitude, Maggie got scared. She could only grit her teeth and not say anything. When she was pushed to the edge, she started crying. Alan used to be most afraid of her tears. Now he was expressionless, even with a hint of scrutiny. Later, he murmured, I was always against it back then, did she feel the same way? 
Maggie didn't know what he was talking about, nor did she want to know. She was extremely sad. She felt like she had made a huge mistake. Turns out, Alan was just like this. She messaged Vicky. She wanted to tell Vicky that she was wrong, that she shouldn't have trusted men so easily, especially not Alan. She wanted to say that Alan was a big liar, saying all those nice things before marriage, but changing after. She wanted to say she would find someone better than Alan, at least someone who wouldn't even deny her money. She thought Vicky would understand her. After editing and revising, Maggie finally sent a message saying, Vicky, I'm returning Alan to you. She thought this sentence would open up the conversation well. She waited for Vicky to ask for the reasons, and then she could tell Vicky everything that had happened. Maybe Vicky would comfort her. After all, the one who had been wrong all along was Alan. But when the message was sent, a bright exclamation mark appeared before her. Vicky has enabled friend verification, and you are not their friend yet. Please send a friend verification request first. After the verification is passed, then you can chat. Maggie stared at her phone for a long time. She raised her head blankly, feeling like she had been slapped for the first time. Chapter 18 Alan and Maggie's marriage only lasted half a year. Later, she found a wealthy second-generation individual. So she hastily divorced Alan and ran off with someone else. She didn't even want the child. But Maggie didn't know, that so-called wealthy second-generation was a fake, brought in by Alan to deceive her. The purpose was to make her agree to the divorce. By the time she realized, it was already too late. Alan sent Susie back to John's parents' house. Because of his affair with Maggie, he had already fallen out with John's parents. Not only John's parents, but also others. It's not an exaggeration to say that they were estranged from everyone. So it wasn't surprising when Alan was eventually kicked out. Luckily, they left behind the child. That child, Alan couldn't take good care of. He didn't even know if he should take care of the child. His original intention was simply to make amends. Alan smoked one cigarette after another. He kept reminiscing about every little detail of his time with Maggie. He wanted to understand where things went wrong. Was it the first time he went to Maggie's house at night? Or the first time he cooked for Maggie? Or was it the first time he neglected Vicky because of Maggie? Even worse, he was wrong from the start when he offered 200,000. One wrong step leads to more mistakes. Regret, it's too late.